Hello and welcome to Survival of the Thickest, testing the process of natural selection by this week. Uh, I actually filled an ecological niche of sorts. Yeah, yeah. All know. right, go on. Well, what's what's this about? Basically, uh, I decided that the library was too busy during the day for me to revise in, but I saw an opportunity, a little gap. And oh, I was... All right, there's a gap in the market that you're willing to exploit. And that gap was at 11 p.m. in the evening in the library. It was almost empty. So I was like, okay, well, I'm going to gonna make the most of this here so i've become semi-nocturnal you're gonna I... swoop in like an owl in e- the later the exactly. later stages of exactly. the uh, of the day and uh do my revision in the evening so there you go i, I feel like that's a, a terrible uh, example of so, uh, what so a niche what, could be but what what does it what does it feel like being conscious at one o'clock in the afternoon <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> um, I'd usually just be kind of starting to wake up, but these past few days I've had a few early mornings, which should kind of put a spanner in the works. Um, but no. Uh, what what t- what time are you normally? So you get in the library about eleven o'clock. What time are you out of there? Um, I I kind of set myself some goals of what I want to do before I before I finish. Um, I see. Look, that's interesting because that's how I've always operated with revision. A lot of people tell themselves. In fact, we when we did the same in uh, in A level, well, a couple of years ago, we'd yeah. always be like, we want to get something done rather than saying, oh, we'll just work, we'll work then... for an hour and then yeah. knock off and play some FIFA. Um, but um, I usually I'd say probably about half three, four o'clock in the morning, and then obviously um... when I come out. I've then got to come home, which isn't a long walk, but it's then I've got to sit on YouTube for another half an hour like we all do. <laughs> so it does get quite late. Um, the fact is that usually, up until that point, what kept me up at about 11 o'clock at night was the SU. It's not far away with its, you know, drum and bass music. What's kept me up the past few nights, well, the past few mornings, um, was actually the Birds Morning Chorus. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, I think I'm up a little bit too late. So uh, anyway. Also, no, before, before we move on i don't know how much sort of credit there is to this and i would love to know more and it probably still doesn't line up with your weird um (laughs) weird sort of nocturnal habits yeah but i have seen at least somewhere on the internet that because of nightlife humans have actually changed their sleeping pattern now, before uh, the Victorian okay. times, before nightlife actually sort of kicked off, yeah. what people would do, allegedly, is go to sleep at sort of uh, 9 o'clock, maybe 8 o'clock, mm-hmm. right? They'd have four or five hours. They'd then get up, like, in the very early stages of the morning. Right, I feel weird. And then they that's when they do sort of their reading and their studying. And then they'd go back to bed, wake up in the morning and go to work. So, in that's theory... So... I, should be, still, I should be getting up at they're 7 o'clock. Still <laughs> getting, they're still getting the same amount of yeah, sleep. But... They just don't go to bed. They go to bed earlier. But wake up they, in the middle they, of the night. They sort of ingest some knowledge halfway through ah. their sort of sleep. Now, I don't know how much truth there is to that, but I certainly thought it was an interesting no, no, no. prospect. It's and like I thought, well, that into. would make sense if the rise of nightlife, when people are only going to bed, like they're coming back from the pub at 11 oh, o'clock, 12 o'clock. Yeah. I've walked to the library and I see people like coming home, you know? Yeah. So, <laughs> damn. <laughs> Got um, tell you what, if they were if they were conscious enough to wonder what the hell you were doing, yeah. they would be thinking there are some... what a loser. I mean, I'm not the only one. Like I go in the library and there are obviously people in there at that time of night. But I get the impression it's a little bit more like I've got to hand in a piece of work at midday yeah, tomorrow I get, yeah. than I'm willingly here off my own accord. You say you say wit Oh, oh, right. That's you being willing, yeah. willingly there. Yeah. Whereas the other people just are like, like, "Oh, well, I've got no oh choice." Oh God! Oh yeah. God! <laughs> oh God! Um, so anyway, uh, that's revision, which is pretty much all what's going on at the moment. Um, but I came to Manchester a few weeks ago, uh, and Cameron, you were doing a kind of a little display kind of thing. Talk me, talk me through I that. Had a, I had, a, I had a thing going on. Yeah. Um, as I, as I 
for some reason keep on mentioning my my course is a little different it means <laughs> i get to well actually all the biologists did this so that's not necessarily oh, okay. true but my course is like you know we live for this stuff we 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 love getting into museums and talking to people and stuff yeah, yeah, yeah. so what we had to do is we went into the manchester museum which is on the campus and we had to choose an object that was available to us and it could be anything from uh, out, out, out of the uh, museum you mean yeah yeah out of the out of their out of their what's the word i'm looking for uh it's not records anyway it out of the out of their archives archives yeah, and we it. uh we picked one um and we put it on a put it on a desk with our tutorial group and we had to try and decide a unifying theme for that mm -hmm. and naturally there are about four or five tables with different tutorial groups that all went for adaption ah. or adaptation even. Yeah, And uh, we, we were one of those because when you've got this series of disjointed, disjointed items, the one thing you can rely on is that they all have an adaptation. I that's, mean, the, that's the beautiful thing about biological artifacts is that they're all unified by... I mean, I mean, uh, without wanting to be too cliche, but that's literally working backwards from the idea of, you know, nothing makes sense in science except for when viewed with natural selection yeah yeah exactly e everything has something that can be related back to that kind of thing so, so it makes sense as to why that's obviously Everyone, the yeah. case yeah yeah um anyway i uh i love my example and it's certainly been taught in uk schools for absolutely years and um which one i mean Re I was relevant there, obviously, relevant but... yeah you 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 popped in thought it would be a good opportunity to talk about it on this but um but i went for the uh the peppered moth oh yeah that i, I this was like one of the very first um kind of examples you get of you know evolution or oh, you know, a natural selection in in school really yeah so, yeah well i mean I, I guess it was one of the first um the first that you got once you sort of understand it like no no, te no teachers coming in at like for year twos and saying yeah get this i mean like it's just so simple it's such a brilliantly simple example that works <laughs> it's right. black and white literally like it's just right. all that. let's explain <laughs> yeah um for reference i'd i'd probably recommend that you just give it a give it a quick googs yeah give it a googs and um just have a look at it because it comes in two forms it comes in a white form with or two main forms comes yeah. in this white with black peppered spots all over it yeah um and due to a mutation in a single gene um you can get variation that makes it have a completely black phenotype yeah so you've got these two sort of populations of the same species yep. one that's white and black one that is totally black yeah now in industrial manchester of course you know if you want to know about where industry began this uh, is it yeah, yeah. this is it Up the northwest north the such. northwest of england yeah um so naturally these factories are producing tons and tons of soot sulfur just exuding it yeah. right into the atmosphere and it coats everything mm -hmm. like it coats all the buildings it's hard to believe now isn't it that, like... you know what um the main manchester university building the first one mm -hmm. which includes the museum um was recently renovated it's uh, it looks sort of quite a light sort of brown looks I, sandy I think now. i know which one you mean when yeah. we arrived or at least i didn't notice but when I first joined the university, it was actually undergoing the change. They were cleaning the soot. Damn. It, it yeah, yeah, it sticks. It Damn. really does. Um, so anyway, yeah. The, so Key to this example, the soot absolutely covers the trees, and uh, which are the habitats for the moth. Mm -hmm. And what happens is, you know, you have a white, a white peppered moth and a black still peppered moth but it's totally black yeah of course the black moth is totally like you uh, you can't see it no nope. on the soot covered tree bird swoops in says i'll nab that <laughs> I'll, na I'll nab that white peppered moth and then 
what was it uh, when it came to about 1894 i think there was another measurement of the population mm-hmm. and i think it was about 98 percent black moth just because they, they were the ones that survived. They always survive. What's because... quite funny is now that there is, of course, since the 70s, the 1970s, when there were some serious um, clean-up acts, cleaning mm-hmm. up the air, the selection pres- pressure has completely vanished. Yeah. And now the, uh, the black peppered moths are in sort of steady decline since the 70s and is that because they're being selected against or is it just they're not being selected against but now they're now they're on a level playing field aren't they yeah i suppose now they now they are just as obvious yeah on a tree well actually that's not necessarily true because the the white peppered moths Mm. are that color because they look a lot like you know when you've got sort of um sort of that white dried lichen yeah I think on the bark of trees Do you mean like on a on a willow is it a willow something like that i don't know sure go for um, it go on that's exactly what it looks like ah, so yeah. arguably the selection pressure is now back on the black peppered moth but... oh no hang on i don't want to say willow now i want to say a silver birch right there you go I'm ultimately does it matter no um <laughs> anyway end of the day there's no soot on the trees anymore no oh okay you so can that see was... both more and, yes, and they had a nice little um, little kind of demonstration box that, that they had the, the three different types of moths in, didn't they? Um, so it was well, quite uh, easy to visualise. So, so far, I've only said there's two. So just to... Just to well, sort oh, of, okay. Just, well, no, thought... just, no, just to sort of breach the confusion, there are three types. The other one isn't as common. It's essentially just a gradient of how black the moths get. But it is still a single gene mutation. And there are all the I same believe, species. I well. believe that the black the black form is um is homozygous recessive right and if you've got heterozygous um that's sort of that's the the third form which i haven't really mentioned because it's not as interesting yeah. Cause it's, ju- it's essentially it's just, in the middle. it's just the gradient it's just it's a bit more black than the wild type moth mm-hmm. it's not completely black like the Mm-hmm. Like the, literally, it's it's something like the carbonara form, and I'm just like, oh, nice. Oh yeah, yeah, it is called that. Yeah, well, okay. Well, you remembered then, clearly. Well done. <laughs> yeah, I'm not bad at this gig. I do. <laughs> <laughs> um, and was there anything else kind of uh, that you on had on the table? If that makes any sense. I remember there was something like uh, um... there was um, there was a butterfly that looks a bit like a leaf. That was quite cool. I think, yeah. We had some, we had some beeswax. We had a dung beetle. Um, we had a Darwin beetle, which are those really cool ones. Which, um, you know, they have um, those massive, massive um, sort of claws. Yeah. Or, no, it's not claws. It, it jaws. They have got these massive jaws. Do you mean like mandibles, or not quite? Kind of similar. Yeah, sure. Um, and they climb up to the top of a tree to to fight for a mate but it is one of those it's another beautiful example of adaptation because it's literally just the beetle with the biggest <laughs> jaws wins. wins yeah every time yeah so so th- it's just this arms race for having the biggest <laughs> jaw and it's it is savage they will chuck each other to the bottom of this tree wwe and then, and then. <laughs> yeah but then the other beetle that's been chucked down has to climb all the way back up which is tiring you know and then by and at the end of the day if you've already been chucked down yeah chances are you just haven't won the genetic lottery your 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 jaws ain't big enough mate no yeah damn <laughs> Oh, so okay. that's pretty cool. We had yeah, yeah. we had we had one of those yeah. in a, in a little box. So what what did you make of kind of you were there for a few hours, weren't you? Um, I was there for one hour. We just sort of split it okay. between the between the tutorial group. Um, because I did I did come along and then um, once you'd finished talking to me, I had a little wander around the museum. And it's actually a very nice place. Like it's I was really pleasantly good, surprised. It? Yeah. And what I liked about it was there was such a broad range of um kind of different types of exhibits. They've got like a vivarium, they've got a uh, they've got an Egyptian section. It was like a nice balance they got between some dinosaurs history and science. Obviously history and science are very important, like to be connected. And you really felt that from what, what you saw in the museum. Yeah. Um so yeah that was good. I, I enjoyed that. 
So we're taking the uh, taking the lazy option this week because again we got we've got revision to do. We do, we do. So, a so lot I of just it. thought, why don't we plunder the plunder the news? Uh... Actually, maybe we can turn this into a thing. We did the same in January, didn't we? We had January exams. So like, well, we've got we'll stuff to do. Well, like, we'll just do we, the news we can't, articles. We can't commit a hell of a lot of time to. I mean, unless we talk about what we're doing, which is it, oh, can, it no can be needs. pretty dry. It can. But um, but the uh, the news articles did not disappoint. Um, well, over the over the last few days, this the first one I want to bring up is actually from two weeks ago, but it's still it's still relevant. Yeah. And how I want to introduce this is by asking you, um, if you had to if you had to you know held at gunpoint and you had to say, what group of people on the internet annoy you the most? Um, that would either be. Uh, it'd probably be lefty people that would they probably annoy me lefties or probably uh f feminist as well they are a bit o t t on the internet uh, have i have i you've actually gone me with up? neither so i'm gonna fish a bit i mean further. okay uh what who else annoys me um, you're, you're, you're... Ve- vegans that's vegetarians. the one you've done it they annoy me on the internet <laughs> don't annoy me in real life too much that's fine but on the internet they just don't stop whining yeah let's let's provide context that like i'm sure any any anyone that's seen saying you, they're they're probably doing a they're they're, they're living a noble cause. Yeah. Their cause is noble. It's not a it's not a bad thing to do. However, their messages on Facebook okay, and Twitter yeah. gets a bit preachy after a while. Yeah, definitely. Now, what I'm going to pose to you now, right? As I think we've also touched on this in podcast before. I want to suggest, right? I'm gonna see if I can change your views on this slightly. We shouldn't be annoyed no. by vegans on the internet. No. Because they're doing us a favour. By making us feel guilty? No. Okay. They're being vegans and vegetarians so that we don't have to. <gasps> That's good logic. I like that. I haven't thought of it like that before. Well, there you go. Well, then I've already done my job here. The, the more people <laughs> that don't eat meat, and um, yeah, it means right. that we still can and not... Hit. Destroy the environment as much. I, I've on. definitely already said this. I firmly believe that one day meat yeah. eating will be yeah, old, yeah, yeah. old fashioned. Yeah. However, you know we're part of that generation, and sad to moment, say, sad to do. say, we're probably not willing to give it up just, just yet. yet. No. Okay. So what I'm saying is that as a global population, we must do our very best to keep our meat demand down purely based on the fact like scientific facts because we it it's a fact yeah, yeah, we, yeah, we the, the over an, animal we, production we, we over does more damage we over to the we over farm yeah we like we we chop we chop down forests yeah so we can grow we plants can that we, we feed eat, yeah. to that we feed to cattle, yeah. which is an incredibly poor and the methane energy malarkey. Sort. The methane thing. because we 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 do or we breed too many cows and they all fart. And, so yeah. what I'm saying is, the more people that jump on the vegan bandwagon as a result of this huge internet campaign, yeah. The, the less guilty we have to feel yeah. about ourselves. Because when I eat meat, it it always crosses my mind. I'm just like, how 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 far has this meat travelled? Yeah. How much and you know, yeah, how how much how much uh, production has gone into this? How how wasteful is this burger yeah, that I I'm mean, eating right now? When, when I'm What's my meat? carbon footprint yeah. when, just say, by eating this burger? When I eat, I'm not feeling guilty. Mm. That, oh, this is, you know, Daisy the cow that I'm eating in my burger. She just wanted to live. Oh, yeah. I'm actually thinking more, what impact am I having on the environment? That's what tricks my guilty conscience. Yeah, that, well, I feel exactly the same because I, as, like, I don't feel, I don't feel distant enough from nature that I'm going to have this ethical dilemma about killing a cow and eating some meat that is just nature in my opinion killing yeah. killing animals and eating however them is what we all do. however our level of production our demand is unsustainable yeah it's ecologically damaging 
but it doesn't have to be. Like if you think about the Really, we should what we should do now is just message Peter and say, Look, you're going the wrong way about it, okay? Not being funny, if I see lots of pigs crying up in a little cage, it's not gonna worry me too much. Yeah, but if I see a polar bear and his ice caps melting because of the cows farting, then I'm gonna be upset. You know what? That's that that triggers an even bigger question, which is why why do we feel bad for the polar bear, right? Because it's cute. It's it lives on a melting rock. Yeah. Its habitat is disappearing Hearing. by the day. Yeah. Whereas, right, if you think about the intensity of agriculture, okay, we and not to mention climate change, to put a long story short, there are areas of the world that like our soil quality is in drastic decline. Yeah. Because over farming there are, there are drier conditions yeah. if we intensively farm the land nutri- Fuck all the nutrient nutrients out of it. nutrients are taken up but they're not put back in yeah no what happens is we're destroying habitats for far more essential organisms like have you have you the heard ones of, that benefit us have you heard, have you heard of the concept of a keystone species no, but so it... a keystone species it speaks for itself really. Yeah, it is a species that provides so many. It it fits into so many ecological niches mm-hmm. that it it makes so many other species redundant. So that like yeah. their their role is so pivotal. Like In an what what I'm or... getting at is we're destro- we're destroying the habitat for the polar bear. Yeah. Why is that a more noble cause than us destroying the habitat of the earthworm? Now, yeah. because because they provide so much in terms of soil quality, they aerate it, they mix it. Yeah, so they they, they are part of a of intricate food chain, and yet the polar bear has the publicity because they're cute. And it's a little bit selfish in a way. Obviously, like a polar bear doesn't do anything really for humans. Like I, I know that there are lots of things that oh, you know, if we keep going like this, the bumblebees will die out, and then we won't be able to pollinate our plants. So that's the kind of thing you're getting at. Is that earthworms do more than polar bears do for humans? And look, panda, except... panda bears are just the same. Who? Why do we give a crap about pandas? To be, I, I saw I saw a Watch Mojo video that said actually panda bears can kill people. So <laughs> why do we care? <laughs> That's another reason to not care. Um, to summarise this section, screw the panda bear, <laughs> long live the earthworm. Yes! <laughs> so you've um, given me a couple of uh, little kind of hints of what we could talk about next, and I was, I was allowed to choose, actually, um, and I decided to go for the one about body odour. I yeah, know. I've I'm gone s- for toilet humour. I'm still 13, you know. Just, like... just, just to provide context, I've selected a range of articles... <laughs> We had a choice between... There was something about Madagascar Mad- dying Madaga- Madagascar's something. biodiversity dying. Or, or should I should say, if you want to hear about this in a later podcast, just yeah. put it in the comments and we'll talk about this exact article. Does me a favour. Yeah. I don't have to look for anything else. Well, that's true. There was also one about HIV and how life expectancy is now near the normal You average. know, a really positive, motivating thing. And I was like, now nah, you know what, let's talk about sweaty pits. So, <laughs> go on, then. What, is it, what is it about? I want to know now. Okay, so there's just people asking the questions. It, this article sort of for a lay audience. What is the smell? What causes it? Mm-hmm. Now, what it is, I'm hoping I can remember it well enough. But it is essentially, it's not the smell of the sort of sweat itself. Inside the sweat, you release certain proteins, mm-hmm. um, which I you know can't find. But um, in them, the, the, the sort of proteins provide the sustenance for microbes that. Their niche is your it's a armpit. perfect breeding uh, ground for yeah. little things. And yeah. what and the smell is when the microbes break up these proteins. It's essentially ah. releasing the odor into the air. So, so it's um, not even like, in a way, it's not even your own body that's making the smell. It's sort of it's sort of the metabolism of 
of just... microbes that is making the smell. Ah, I didn't and know so, that. And um, okay. And sort of f- further from that, um, you may think to yourself, "Oh, I proper stink today." Yeah. Um, what this scientist is suggesting that is, you know what, you actually probably don't because you're smelling your own smell. To quote the article, right, your nose is essentially getting front row seats at your own <laughs> stench. Yeah. And so... Um, well, I, I've always been under the impression that if you can smell yourself, then you definitely need to have a wash. Like, because usually, like, I don't know, I feel like you probably just smell that's anyway. The thing. Just practically speaking... You're much closer to you than anyone than else anyone is. Else is Unfortunately, to you. I, I do try, so... but I never get anywhere. <laughs> Go on. <laughs> so, so um, often, often, if uh, you think you smell, just just ask someone. Yeah. Can, can you smell me? More often than not, apparently they won't because ah. yeah, you you are the closest to you that you can get, which I... is a ridiculous statement. Um, but... Yeah. Um, I'd like to look into this really because it makes me think. So, so what does what does having a wash do? Like, let's just say you washed your armpit. Is are you actually getting rid of the smell by washing away um, the, the the proteins that the bacteria metabolize, or are you actually simply washing away the bacteria? And I, then... I would pr- I would assume I don't think it was mentioned, but I would assume it's at least a little bit of both. And then I if... think you give yourself a good scrub. You're certainly getting rid of some of the microbes yeah. that are down there. However, by having a wash, you're also you're not you're not sweating while you're washing, are you? And, and on a, now you say it, it sounds obvious because if you think about it, we sweat all over our bodies. We sweat like on a hot day, we sweat everywhere. But you never go, God, you know what? My right arm stinks. Really stinks. Like, it's not that. It's is not it? that. It's, it's, it's in the armpit bit, because it's, it's this in nice, those areas. sweaty, dark crevice that is. <laughs> <laughs> oh, lovely, just, lovely. Just, just to return to the point, we could be having a really meaningful <laughs> discussion about the life expectancy of HIV instead of talking about sweaty the crevices. <laughs> no, I, honestly, I've learned something now. You've actually impressed me. I like that. I uh, don't worry about HIV. That'll sort itself out. But sweaty <laughs> armpits. Yes, we've we've learned something. There's, a, today. there's an everyday man's problem that we can really <laughs> really touch base with. Oh, but, so basically, instead of using links, I'm just going to start you know spraying myself down with I don't know um, antibacterial antibacterial uh, <laughs> spray. I'll get some Dettol and just like you know spray. <laughs> I'll put it in like I'll put it in a squirty can. Oh, it's already in a squirty in a squirty bottle. I just spray away, and then oh. <laughs> I mean, it, no, it does make sense. You, you don't, you, when you sweat, it's not, you don't just go, oh, my arm stinks, you know. Uh, it, and that's, yeah, quite, an inter- that's that. quite an interesting one, yeah. Um, so anyway, we'll leave uh, today on a positive note, because Cameron, you've got a job. <laughs> Something very similar. Well, I don't, I don't want to say that now. I mean, they might hate me when I go and uh, go and visit them, but... Um... No, well, I mean, look, now's your chance to impress them before you even get there. Uh, you, you told me a little bit, but I don't really know what. What, where, well, where, what are you talking about? On a I am gonna, I'm putting a pressure on, yeah. What, what, what happened? What did you do? Did you... No, I just I just registered interest in working with a sort of big... Uh, well, you haven't got to mention any names, so, you know. A big, a big sort of plant science company. Yeah. In, just for a bit in, of summer in, work, yeah? In Cambridge. Yeah, yeah for, for, I'd be... Uh, I, I, didn't, I didn't mind what I'd be doing. But I've been I've been offered offered up some lab work, so I'm so I'm really looking forward. No, to no, that. that's really good. I'm pleased for you, like because you know it's. it's it, it, I'm going to be sort of assessing, I believe, sort of grain size, grain content in like protein oh, okay. content, starch content. I imagine it's going to be all that all that fun stuff, and I'm assuming that it's going to be um, sort of, I on their on their website there was something about how. The, the seeds that they were looking at right at that moment. I don't know how recently it's been updated. Yeah. But it was something to do with how there are two different types of starch. And one of them is a better storage version as far as we're concerned. Yeah. I don't know whether it's it's more bioavailable to us or it, it literally just breaks down yeah. easier. Um, but they're tr- they're, I think... Certainly, what it was in there. I don't know if I'll be involved in it at all, but they were trying to breed 
uh, s- seeds that would not store such starch but in one way and not another. So, you, so you know, um, that that does sound interesting. Um, that's good. I, I think I, I don't know whether I'll be involved. H- in how that long? How long are you at this place for? Um, I could have been there a lot longer. I think I have to be back in uni for early September. But I think I'll be basically July to August. Yeah, labbing about. Well, I think that's going to give us plenty to talk about then, isn't it? Well, let's hope so. Let's hope so. <laughs> um, okay, so I think we'll end it there. Um, we uh, have got a couple of weeks of exams coming up, so if you wouldn't mind, wish us the best of luck. I'm obviously only a first year, only need 40%, but Cameron oh, over here. I just thought we could, <laughs> we could do that awful thing where one like equals one good <laughs> luck. <laughs> Yeah. If you scroll past and don't like you, you hope that we'll fail. Yeah. So, um... and if we fail, and uh, we, I don't get to. Sec- I'm not going to bother. If I fail, sec- get into second year, I'm going to give up. So <laughs> there'll be no more podcasts that you know the the few of you that listen will have to listen to. So, <laughs> <laughs> oh, anyway, um... we don't endorse that. Just for the record, that was a joke. That was a Do joke. what you want. Um, so <laughs> I think we'll be back in a few weeks' time. Um, we hope that you enjoyed today. Again, oh, a, a few bit... weeks' time. That'll be post-exam. That could, I know. There could be two very different versions of that podcast. <laughs> <laughs> no, there will be one positive one. Um, <laughs> thank you very much for listening. It's been a little bit of a all-over-the-place wild episode, um, but I enjoyed recording it, and I hope you listen- enjoyed listening to it as well. Um, and I guess we'll see you next time on Survival of the Thickest.